Greetings from Concordia Theological Seminary in scenic Fort Wayne, Indiana. Proper 7 is upon us, Matthew, 5, Matthew 10, 5a, 21 to 33. And for the next two weeks, we're going to be journeying together. Yes, stay tuned to the next lectionary podcast. You'll hear me again. And one of the challenges that we have, frankly, with both of these readings, both for this Sunday and the following, is that they're basically dealing with very similar issues. The issue is, what is, are the implications for the kingdom of God being at hand? Already, Matthew is governed by the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is on the scene. Miracles are being done. But now the disciples are being sent out. And we discover what it means to see the kingdom of heaven at hand. Namely, that when the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it will meet pretty strict, pretty severe opposition. The text starts out relatively straightforward. 10.5a introduces this pretty large chunk of Matthew here. When Jesus sends out the 12, the ministry is initially limited. It's only, it's only to the Jews, uh, not to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but rather focusing on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Namely, that the initial ministry of the disciples really follows that pattern that Acts picks up as well. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Abraham is now on the scene. In order for the Abrahamic covenant to be in force, for, for Abraham to be a blessing to the nations, Israel needs to be made right through the proclamation of the gospel. And when the proclamation of the gospel happens by these 12 apostles, who are now the ascent ones, uh, opposition happens. Uh, the language is actually pretty striking here. We skip over a large swath of text and to perhaps appreciate what's going on in 21 to 33. We need to take a look at 16 as well, which really does set the scene. The disciples are told throughout these preceding verses to our pericope for this Sunday that they are to go every place, be patient, expect opposition. If they're welcomed, great. If not, move on. If they are accepted, great, they can continue their ministry. If not, they leave and entrust the judgment and the condemnation to God. Uh, hence, verse 15 of chapter 10 is pretty striking here. Uh, Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah for that town. Uh, note to those of you keeping score at home, Sodom and Gomorrah imagery generally not a good thing. It's in this context of expecting opposition then now Matthew flashes it out more. The issue becomes, what is the reaction to God's kingdom at hand? Uh, Jesus is pretty, pretty straightforward. He predicts that slaughter will happen and the world will hate them. And this language of death is actually pretty surprising, especially verse 21. A brother will deliver brother over to death. Father is child. Children will rise against their parents. The kingdom of heaven is so shocking. Jesus' mission is so shocking that it causes radical social upheaval. Uh, this would be unthinkable in a communal culture like that of the first century. It's one thing for us to think about uh, disobedient children. Perhaps you have one, hypothetically speaking, of course. It's quite another to see this as a social evil that would cause people to be absolutely shocked. But the good news is actually in verse, in verse 23. The verse itself is somewhat odd, uh, which reads, When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. Okay, that part's not too exciting. For truly I say to you, you will have not gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Jesus answers initially the problem of opposition with an eschatological hope. Namely, that they will keep going and rest assured that they will still be going and not done with their work before he comes again. This has a much more of a second advent focus than first advent focus here in, in verse 23. To paraphrase, to living Bible it, if you will, uh, take heart, I'm coming, and you're not going to be exhausted because I will come before you're done. And that already is a pretty strong message of hope. To those who receive opposition, it continues to go on. 
that Jesus continues to offer a message of hope. Uh, verses 26 to 27, in which they're told not to have fear, which is a hard thing to preach on, because we are fearful people after all. But the good news is that already Jesus promises that they will be vindicated, that nobody can stop them. And that's the point of verse 26, 27. How do you continue? One, with the knowledge that what you proclaim will be publicly vindicated. And then verse 28, why do you preach? Why do you proclaim? Because ultimately, they can't kill you. Oh, sure, they can kill the body, but they can't care, kill your very being. And then finally, that they cannot undo the Father's will or care in these final verses of the pericope. The sparrows is a, perhaps a bit of a cliched image, but we need to keep it again in this context. Why should we not be afraid? Well, ultimately, the one who vindicates us, the one who's given us new life in Christ, cares so much for us that he will carry us through to the very end. There are eschatological consequences in this, and an eschatological hope that keeps the disciples going, even as they experience opposition. That's perhaps enough for now here in Matthew 10. Uh, stay tuned for the next riveting installment next week, in which we will continue these themes, these themes of what does it mean to deal with opposition, and how does Christ provide comfort and mission. May God continue to bless you upon your preaching in this coming week. Amen.